Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi there, welcome to the week's three to four S2S webinar series. We will get started in just a minute. Hello and welcome to the week's three to four S2S webinar series. Um, my name is Karen Keefe from NWS OSTI Modeling. I'd like to welcome you. Um, just a few things before we get started. We do have a VLAB website. And if you go onto it, you can find all of our previous webinars. If you've missed any in the previous months, you can click on them. And we do have recordings and presentation slides. So if you're interested in taking a look at some of our previous presentations, please check out our uh, website. Also, if you would like to get notifications for our webinar series that's held every month, you can subscribe here. Or if you wish to become a, a, a future speaker, you can fill out this Google form on our website and we can set you up. This is also a call. We have openings starting in October. So if you're interested in giving a talk or prepping for AMS or AGU, this would be a really good time. So please fill out the Google form and we will be in touch with you. Also, um, everyone is muted on this call today. So if you have any questions, we have a discussion document for questions. I will be putting the link to this document in the chat. Please um, type any questions you have for our presenters here. And then they can, uh, we, if we have time at the end, they can either answer them live on the webinar or they can um, respond back to you on this document. All right, and I'm gonna pass it over to Maria for our first talk today on tropical dynamics diagnostics for numerical weather prediction. Okay. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Very good. Make this go away. Okay. So um, I'm going to be talking about tropical diagnostics for numerical weather prediction that we've been working on over the past year and a half, I would say. And a lot of these are based on diagnostics that we've been using for years on observational data. And it needed some adaptation to actually be able to do this with uh, numerical weather prediction model output. And this is joint work with Brandon Walding, Juliana Diaz, and George Calades at Ceres in Boulder and at NOAA. So the numerical weather prediction models tend to perform better in mid-latitudes than in the tropics when it comes to precipitation forecasts. And part of the reason is that the underlying dynamics are very different in the tropics and the mid-latitudes, where in the tropics, convection is the main driver of precipitation um, compared to mid-latitudes where you have um, larger scale waves, um, wave trains and Rossby waves being the main driver. And then, so because of that, and and uh, fronts, of course, and because of that, 
convective parametrization has a much larger impact on the precipitation forecast in the tropics. In addition to that, there's also evidence from previous studies that better forecast skill in the tropics can lead to improved forecasts in the latitudes. So we would like to focus on what is precipitation skill in the tropics and what is precipitation skill in the tropics for phenomena that potentially have um, predictability past a few days and can be used if we can improve the forecast of those phenomena can be used to enhance pre precipitation skill and forecast skill and latitudes at longer lead times as well. And what I'm showing here is um, just a comparison between the GFS version 15 operational and version 16 uh, retrospective for the same time period in the tropics and the mid latitudes. And just to illustrate this point, that they tend to be better in the mid latitudes, the equitable threat score um, and the fraction skill score in particular at different thresholds for precipitation. Um, it's not very well understood which process in particular in the tropics are important for mid-latitude forecast skill. Um, there are some well-known sources of predictability, such as the MJO and convectively coupled equatorial waves in the tropics. And so we would like to introduce some metrics and diagnostics that look at these phenomena in particular, so that we can better understand the numerical weather prediction model behavior with respect to tropical convection and to identify forecast error sources in the tropics that are related to moisture convection coupling, convectively coupled equatorial waves, and the MGO. So the numerical weather prediction evaluation presents a different challenge than climate model evaluation. The forecasts tend to be shorter. They tend to be a couple of days out to um, several weeks. The model versions change frequently. And because of that, it's very rare to have long, and by long, I mean multi-year time series of operational model runs with the same model version. And the other thing we wanna do is we wanna consider these diagnostics as a function of lead time. So we can distinguish between um, if a certain phenomenon is initialized correctly, and if it is initialized correctly, how long is the model able to keep that information and propagate it for, forward into the forecast. The diagnostics I'm gonna be looking at here are Hoffmuller diagrams of precipitation and the pattern correlation. And this looks at zonal propagation of precipitation and errors in that. We're gonna look at space-time coherence spectra, uh, which identifies scales of coupling of precipitation to moisture. Uh, I'm also going to look at vertical structure of coherence between precipitation and different dynamical fields. So we can see what the vertical structure is on the phase relationship within these convectively coupled equatorial waves. Then I'm going to look at convectively coupled wave activity and scale. And I'm going to look at some, show, so sh show some diagnostics that look at moisture and convection coupling. So looking at the co-evolution of precipitation and column saturation fraction. The model output that is needed for these is um, gridded 2D fields of precipitation, surface pressure, and the land sea mask, um, gridded 3D fields of temperature, specific humidity, and winds. And on the right here, I'm showing a little um, graphic of what I mean when we look at these um, forecasts by lead time. So let's say you have initializations every 12 hours, and you have forecast hour zero forecast every 12 hours, which are the circles, the orange circles. And then you have, for each of these forecasts, you have a 12-hour forecast, a 24-hour forecast, and a 36-hour forecast. What I'm doing is I'm just grouping all the forecast hour zero forecasts together and make a time series, a 12-hourly time series based on that in this example, taking all the 12-hour forecasts and making a time series just including the 12-hour forecast and so on. Um, the development of these diagnostics, we focused on the operational version 15 and retrospective version 16 model versions. 
And that's what I'm going to show in the examples, these two um, model runs. And then to um, evaluate these, I'm going to look at error five and at observed precipitation data sets. And that the observed precipitation data sets in this case are going to be mainly the iMERGE version six precipitation. Um, yeah, so the these version 15 and version 16 uh, model runs are initialized every six hours. So I'm going to end up with a six hourly time series from, and I'm looking at the time period of 2019, um, December 1st through March 31st, 2020. And the forecast that run out to um, 10 days. I'm also planning on applying these diagnostics to the UFS ESTAS prototype five. And I just heard that there's a prototype six. So I'm probably going to go with the prototype six model runs um, to see how those results change from the operational runs. So the first diagnostic are the half model diagrams and the pattern correlations. And the first uh, four panels I'm showing here are half model diagrams of precipitation uh, during this time period for iMERGE era five, uh, V15 and V16. Um, and you can see that some of these large scale features are uh, pretty well captured by both model versions. And to assess which of these model versions potentially has a um, better performance, we can look at the pattern correlation between the forecast and the truth. And the truth in this case, I'm using three different um, estimates of the truth. I'm using iMERGE, I'm using error five precipitation, the forecast hour six um, model precipitation for both of these model runs. And this, what I'm showing you, the pattern correlations I'm showing on the in the bottom panel here, with the um, confidence estimate. But the confidence estimate are very estimates are very small. The intervals, the 90% intervals. Um, and what you can see is that the operational GFS only shows minor differences to the experimental version 16 in this case. If you compare to error five precipitation, they're both very similarly skilled. But if you look at how the model forecast diverges from its own forecast hour six precipitation, then the experimental version 16 diverges more quickly from its own initial state than the version 15. The next diagnostic are space-time coherence spectra. And space-time coherence spectra look at how well do the models initialize and pr propagate convectively coupled equatorial waves. And for those of you that are not very familiar with these, if you look at the top left panel, these are essentially zonal wave number on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis diagrams. And the color shading shows the coherence in this panel between ERO5 precipitation and iMERGE precipitation. And what you can see is that uh, the high values of coherence tend to line up with the theoretical dispersion curves of convectively coupled equatorial waves. And what that means is that within these um, large scale tropical waves, the two, um, the era five precipitation and the iMERGE precipitation tend to vary more coherently than they do at shorter time scales uh, and smaller zonal scales. And then if you do this, look at the same thing, but looking at the version 15 and version 16 forecast hour six precipitation compared to iMERGE, you see a very similar picture, except that you can see in the version 15, you have a gap in coherence at zonal wave number zero, which is uh, improved in the version 16. And if you go further along in the forecast to forecast hour 48, so a two day forecast for both of these, you can see that the coherence slowly decreases as uh, into the model forecast. The other thing you can look at is that you can evaluate the consistency between or the coherence between 
model precipitation and model divergence, which is what I'm showing here in the second um, the second row for a divergence at 850 hectopascal. And again, in the observations, if you look at error interim, uh, error five, sorry, uh, precipitation versus error five divergence, you can see that you have peaks and coherence in this Kelvin wave band, for example. And if you're looking at the forecast hour six coherence, you can see very similar peaks and coherence for both model versions. But then if you look at the forecast hour 48, you can see that the V15 forecast loses this coherence faster than the version 16. Um, the next diagnostic is looking at convectively coupled equatorial wave activity. And the way I do this is I'm using a long time series of observed precipitation. In this case, I use trim precipitation and also Persian CDR precipitation. And I filter those time series for the convectively coupled wave region of interest and then compute the first four UFs and that use those to describe the convectively coupled equatorial wave signal. And then I can project the model precipitation at each forecast hour onto these UF patterns. And that gives me a convectively coupled equatorial wave activity index. And that is what I'm showing in the two top panels here for the Kelvin wave and for the equatorial Rossby wave on the right. And the different lines are um, this projection onto these UFs for iMERGE, ERA5 in black, and then version 15 and version 16 and the two different colors. To get a skill for this, you can compute the anomaly correlation between the observed and the model index. And for the observed index, I'm using the iMERGE uh, index up here. And what you can see is that the convectively coupled equatorial wave forecasts are generally improved for the first 48 hours in version 16 compared to version 15, but the differences tend to be significant only for the first 12 hours. And part of this could be that I'm using only four months of forecast. So if there's a longer time series available for these forecasts, this, uh, the significance might change and you might have um, more significant or more significant differences at longer lead times as well. The next diagnostic is the vertical structure of coherence. And this can be thought of as um, a proxy for the vertical profile of latent heating associated with the deep convection of, in this case, I'm showing the example for a convectively coupled Kelvin wave. And again, I'm using filter precipitation, and then I compute the coherence with the dynamical variables at all vertical levels. So this is a lot more computationally expensive than the other diagnostics because you have to include all vertical levels for the dynamical variables. But the results point to issues in the coupling between the large scale dynamics and the convection. The divergence coherence with the filter precipitation appears um, too weak and it's at slightly higher levels than the observed um, coherent peak and coherence. And again, this coherence decreases with lead time. So the model is able to initialize this uh, vertical structure correctly. And it, that's true for both the V15 and the V16 model runs. But then again, with lead time, the model loses um, the representation of this wave. And I think um, looking at the space-time spectra that I showed earlier, you can see that the models tend to propagate these uh, Kelvin waves a little too fast compared to observations, which is why you're losing this, uh, or part of the reason why you're losing this coherence. The um, moisture convection coupling essentially looks at the co-evolution of precipitation and column saturation fraction. Um, and what this shows is that up here is that each arrow shows you the evolution over 12 hours between of precipitation and calm saturation fraction um, in the model. And what you can see, uh, or sorry, in observations, so I merge in ERA5 in this case. And 
what you can see is that you get this gradual moistening and increase in precipitation. And then as you get to really high precipitation rates and really high column saturation fraction, the precipitation rates decrease very quickly and then you slowly, uh, you can, these areas are hard to see, you slowly decrease the column saturation fraction and then essentially you start this um, convective cycle again. And um, what happens in the model runs is that the version 16 is a big improvement over version 15 in this um, metric because the version 15 um, actually has this evolution going in the wrong direction, whereas the version 16 is able to have this core evolution go in the correct correction. One caveat to this is that the error five may also not be showing the real evolution as um, this current work that Brandon Wolding is leading, that there are differences between reanalysis and radio sound data, and we're currently investigating that. Um, comparing this to the near surface moisture is that while we saw this um, improvement in the moisture convection coupling, um, this is not reflected if you're looking at the um, relationship, uh, the anomaly cor um, correlation for two meter um, specific humidity and for uh, mean square error skill score for specific humidity at two meters. Um, so what this means is that these Tropical diagnostics um, actually add value to this model evaluation by capturing different um, aspects of the model performance than the traditional skill or statistical skill metrics that um, we're already looking at regularly. Another aspect of this moisture convection coupling is that you can look at the precipitation pickup and convective life cycle in buoyancy space. And again, this is based on a uh, work that Brandon Walding has been doing. And you can see if you look at observations, which in this case I'm taking iMERGE and ERA5, um, you have a evolution around this mode of observations, which is this gray circle. And um, you can see that in this case, both models actually are able to have this the correct evolution but when you look at the shading, which is the precipitation rate based on buoyancy, you have the precipitation pickup or increase goes for version 15 goes from essentially from left to right and doesn't have a slant like the const lines of constant buoyancy. So in the model world, the precipitation pickup only cares about the dilution of the buoyancy in this case and does not care about total buoyancy, which is not the same as you see in ERA5 and iMERGE. So to summarize, um, so we've worked on these diagnostics uh, for numerical weather prediction model evaluation in the tropics. And this was primarily done for NOAA's NGGPS. And the goal here is to help identify forecast error sources in the tropics related to moisture convection coupling, convectively coupled equatorial waves and the MJO. And we're considering these diagnostics as a function of lead time in order to distinguish between um, initial condition errors in the model and model errors themselves. And we show this comparison between the version 15 and the version 16 model forecasts that there is a performance improvement um, in the version 16 forecasts in some of these metrics, but that does not mean necessarily that you will see this in the more traditional statistical metrics that um, we're used to looking at. Um, I do have a standalone Python GitHub repository for these diagnostics, and there is a release um, out there for public, uh, there's a public release out there for testing. Um, and several of these diagnostics were already included in a recent release of um, MedPodPy and MedCalpPy. And 
I think the only one that's still missing is the convectively coupled wave activity index, and that will be added in the near future. And what I'm also planning on adding these um, capabilities to the model diagnostics task force diagnostics package. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Um, we don't have any questions in the doc. Oh, one's popping up right now. So one minute, please. Um, we have a question. How is the model projection onto the EOFs earlier discussed done? Um, let's see. So we have two dimensional EOFs in latitude and longitude, and it's just a simple um, matrix multiplication, essentially, so that you end up with the, um, with the time series at the end. Does that make sense? Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. OK. Um, here's another one. Um, it would be great if you can apply the diagnostics to S2S prototype 7 and 8 instead of 5 and or 6. Um, prototype 7 will be ready in just a few weeks, says Fenglin. Oh, that's perfect, because I won't be back from maternity leave until September, so I can do that. <laughs> Great. OK, one more question's coming in. I think this will be the last one before we have to switch over to Tara. But you can, people, um, you can still please ask questions on this document, and Maria can look at it and respond. Did you apply the band pass filter for the wave projection? Yes. So I applied the band pass filter to the observed um, precipitation before I computed the UFs, which is why I was using the observed um, precipitation in the first case, because there are more, uh, much longer time series available. So these band pass filters are more accurate. Oh, one more, one more minute. Um, I see another one here popping up. Oh, and Fenglin asks, also says to contact him for the location of the data. Um, okay, I will do that. Thank you. Yep. One more quick one here. Are these diagnostics available only in MET Culpi and not regular MET? Uh, that's a question for Tara. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Oh, Tara answered that one. There we go. Okay. Thank you so much, Maria. <laughs> Uh, I think there's a couple more that might be um, typing in. So just um, if you could please um, keep track of the document. OK, I'll take a look. Thank you. OK, next we're going to pass it over to Tara. Thank you. And uh, some of these questions are really great um, segues to my presentation. So hopefully by the end of my presentation, you'll have a little bit better feel for um, what is already in MetPlus. So I'm, I'm working on showing my screen right now. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, MetPlus. Uh, Try to do this as quickly as possible, but you know, there's a lot in there. So uh, we're going to be moving pretty, pretty quickly here. I do want to acknowledge that um, we do have contributions um, from not only um, uh, Maria and her colleagues at PSL, but also um, from University of uh, Urbana-Champaign um, and uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Sorry about that. Um, Zhao Wang um, is a professor, and, and uh, you know some of her students have provided um, uh, uh, diagnostics as well. Um, and then we're looking to um, to be. Uh, including some additional diagnostics from George Mason University, as well as some additional from PSL. And then we're also working um, very directly right now with NOAA CPC, trying to uh, make sure that there is capability um, in MetPlus um, for 
uh, evaluating um, the subseasonal as well as um, you know soon to be the SFS in a couple of years, um, uh, both at EMC as well as CPC. So there's a lot of work going on right now in MET Plus with regards to week three, four, especially. Uh, so um, if you don't know what MET Plus is yet, um, here's the very, very um, quick and, and um, succinct version of it. Basically, MET Plus is a suite of, a suite of Python wrappers around um, the, the core tool, MET, which does um, most of the statistics um, computation, but also has diagnostic tools in it, such as um, the method for object-based diagnostic evaluation, the, the objects that are in the center of this um, slide. Um, we also have Python wrappers um, that um, take output from MET, um, can either dump it into a database and display system, or can um, just use the Python plotting scripts um, directly. And actually much of what um, Maria just presented um, is uh, uh, not um, being, um, you know, it, it's not in the database and display system. It, it's some of it is being pre-processed using MET, and then a lot of the calculations and plotting are in the Python scripts, which you mentioned are called MET CalPy and MET PlotPy. Um, then there's the communication between MET and Python algorithms, which allows for much more flexibility, and is um, part of uh, what we're hoping to. To leverage um, to uh, take advantage of um, other capability that Maria is bringing in, as well as um, you know the the other contributions from um, uh, GMU and PSL and CPC and maybe possibly connections to MDTF or M yeah MDTF I always get the DMT the T mixed up um, anyways. Uh, so we, we are um, looking to, to try and make connections between MET Plus and MDTF to take advantage of all the other fantastic diagnoses that are, are already in that framework. Um, MET Plus has over, over 100 traditional statistics and diagnostic methods. And so, um, you know, some of those are applicable to S2S, but uh, many of them are also, you know, applicable to medium range weather as well as um, short range weather, you know, high, high, um, uh, um, high resolution modeling and so forth. Um, and they can, it, it can also be applied to climate uh, modeling as well. Um, and then one of the, the things about MET Plus is that um, the configuration files are, are developed so that it can provide easy sharing um, of those, con um, those configurations uh, to produce re reproducible results. Here's um, the overarching um, look at um, MET Plus, and I don't want you to really focus in on all the different aspects of it other than to recognize that just like many other tools um, in Linux, uh, there are, um, you know, uh, several different paths you can take through the, the tool set in order to uh, um, accomplish the, the type of verification you need. So, um, for example, you need to just know whether you're um, working with gridded data and gridded um, analyses, or if you're trying to compare to gridded data and um, point observations, or if you're trying to evaluate something that is a point forecast with a, a point observation. And based on that, um, there are se several tools that you can use in MET. Um, and then uh, all of the, the, uh, the rest of this down here in the yellows, greens, and oranges, we call that basically our MET plus uh, analysis suite at this point. Um, and once again, you don't necessarily really need to, to know all the inner workings of what's in here because um, that is what MET Plus is supposed to do. It's supposed to wrap it all up, make it easy for, for the data to flow through all the different tools um, to, to reach the, the final result. So um, the question that um, was asked whether um, you know some of the diagnostics that Maria presented, um, whether it's in MET, only in MET CalPy or is it in MET, the answer actually is it's in MET Plus. MET Plus is the framework and then all the other um, uh, names that you hear are just the, the components um, that, that make up that framework, similar to, you know, a modeling system where you have to take several steps in order to pre-process the data and then, um, you know, you have all of your different um, parameterization schemes and, and so forth. I mean, there, it, it's, it's just, you have to have things broken up in, in certain ways to make it easier and more um, flexible to develop and, and use. Most of the S2S diagnostics um, are going to be following this path where they're, they're likely going to be, um, you know, going through MET for some um, initial uh, preparation of the data that um, allows us to be able to handle MET CDF, GRIB files, and, and so forth, um, you know, in a consistent manner. Um, and then uh, 
Uh, many of them are, are um, uh, having some additional com computation um, performed in that meta-analysis suite or met plus analysis suite by um, met calc pi, met plot pi, and then you finally um, wind up with your diagnostic plots. So it's um, not as complicated as, as what um, the original schematic looks like. Here's an analogy that maybe will help some of you guys understand what MET plus is. Um, so if you think of MET as the statistical engine, so that does all the heavy lifting, all the work, um, and then MET plus is basically what drives the processes and keeps everything together and, and you know, makes it easier um, to, to use the tools. So that's kind of like the, the body of a, of a car, um, steering wheel, you know, just things that are, are um, intended to help drive the, the um, the engine around basically and then the met plus analysis suite are basically the accessories that make the processes better and make it easier to um, to use all the tools and so forth um, besides um, the diagnostics there are a whole host of different um, types of methodologies um, we have traditional statistics we have spatial um, methods um, most you know that, that can be used as diagnostics we have um, you know uh, 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 a lot of capability that is focused on tropical cyclones and, and um, uh, diagnosing what's going on um, with tropical cyclones. Neighborhood methods, in case you want to um, be doing any, in essence, this is um, helping you with upscaling or, or downscaling, depending on, on how you um, look at that. Uh, we have a lot of flexibility in how, you know, the masking can be applied, day-night masks, um, you know, uh, looking within a certain radius around a, a particular point or along a track, only looking at the tropics or only looking at the poles, um, auto automated regridding. So that um, allows for easier prep time or you know, preparation of, of the data if you have data that are, are on two different resolutions. I already mentioned Python embedding in order to make it more flexible um, to get data into the, the MET tools, um, especially uh, either uh, computing different fields that um, are not actually in the model output or um, just handling um, some pre-processing um, for reading in data. Um, and then uh, I'm going to go over some of the rest of this in the next slide. Uh, as long as I can click. Here we go. Maybe. Maybe it'll let me. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, so, uh, so what we've added um, recently uh, in our collaborations with Zhao Wang um, include um, you know, being able to, to look at multivariate distributions of, um, of two different model fields, and it's flexible enough that you can, you can specify which fields you want to, to look at. The example that we have here is total precip versus precipitable water. Um, we also added in uh, some um, uh, looking at some um, TC genesis and, and just TC uh, occurrence or TC track. Um, uh, diagnostics to help with um, S2S, but uh, it, uh, we also have tools that are flexible enough to look at it in more of a short range or medium range perspective. Um, we've extended MO, the object-based method, to be able to um, create super objects from multivariate fields um, in, in order to, to be able to better identify, um, you know, phenomena that, that are not just related to one um, particular field. Um, you already heard the discussion from Maria about Hoffmuller's and the space-time coherence spectra, so that has um, been added into that plus um, and, and, you know, has been available uh, uh, since May. Um, and then there's uh, several other spatial methods, just being able to look at the, the, um, the errors uh, in a, with a geographic representation. Uh, we have what's called feature relative um, examples that allow you to look over multiple, uh, many uh, case studies and look for systematic errors, say for instance of a um, explosively growing extratropical cyclone um, scenario or, or you know, um, TC um, development or rapid intensification or, you know, droughts or, you know, whatever it did. So you can look at, at look for systematic errors using um, the tools. So now quickly going over, um, I just want to give you a little bit of detail about specifically um, some new S2S metrics that have been added um, just recently. They are not in the official uh, coordinated release that went out in May, but they're in the, the next beta um, and are available if you either want to just pull down our develop branch and get things um, you know, compiled and, and working, or if you are um, at EMC and have access to HERA um, or WCOS, um, 
uh, you can you can use these. Um, we uh, will be getting them um, installed also on Stampede and Cheyenne um, in a beta um, release so that they're um, available you know more quickly than than the um, the coordinated releases that we give. So um, there's OMI um, has been added uh, and you can either use the model or the observations or, or both. Um, there's uh, one optional pre-processing step in there um, to be able to, to um, transform the domain and cut it down to the, the right um, latitude band. Um, and then the calculations occur and then um, it goes all the way to plotting the phase diagram. I just wanted to give you a sense of how, how the setup um, for this occurs. Uh, basically, um, we have some sample data so you can test it out um, with the, the um, OLR um, and then um, the EOFs. Those are um, already pre-generated. Um, and then um, what you would wind up doing is you would just go into um, MET plus into the PARM directory into uh, model applications and you could modify this um, this particular configuration file in order to pass it, um, you know, uh, where you have the data on your particular system and so forth. You can also select whether you want to run forecasts or obs or both, um, the number of observations that are available per day, and um, if there's any specifics for plotting that you, you want to include um, in, in, the, um, in the plots. Um, similarly, uh, we just added RMM, um, RMM 1 and 2. Um, and um, same thing, uh, it uses either model observation or both. There's, um, you know, the, the one pre-processing step potentially to be able to, um, you know, select out the, the proper latitude band. It performs calculations and then it plots um, the phase diagram. Um, you know, the, the data are um, listed here. This is the script, uh, or excuse me, the, the configuration file. Um, these are the options that are available. I'm not going to speak through them because we have a lot more to cover still. Um, but the result is um, here. You can see the RMM um, using uh, both the, the first and second um, EOF. Um, and uh, once again, just um, confirming that this is also in version 4.1.0 beta 1. Um, so look for it in the develop branch on the GitHub repository. There's some, a, a few um, additional things that are um, available. You could just um, use um, plus to, to compute the, the phase diagrams rather than doing all the, the computation um, from text data that uh, is either available from um, PSL or the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia. Um, and then um, we do have the ability um, in MET in one of our tools, the PCP combined tool to, um, to uh, compute um, anomalies um, and uh, we're looking to also add in that support in Python. Um, so, so that's uh, some of the newest diagnostics that we've added in. Now, a quick overview of some of the other um, diagnostics um, that have been added recently. The, um, the next suite of, of diagnostics I'm going to go through are in MetPlus 4.0, the coordinated release. So you can, um, if you want to, um, you know, go up and, and grab it um, from um, GitHub repository, look for the main version 4.0 branch. Um, you know, similarly, um, it, it's set up to um, either work with model observations or both. Um, preferably, they want, you know, 20 to 30 years. We don't have that large of a sample um, available for testing purposes, um, but, you know, we do have sample data available. There's um, some optional pre-processing steps, um, depending on whether you want to do some regridding. Um, ahead of time, or if you want to um, be computing the daily mean um, and the forecast lead mean and the running means and so forth using that PCP combined tool. Um, then there's four um, calculation steps that um, are computed, and once again, MetPlus actually passes um, the data through all these, these calculation steps, so you don't have to call them in individually, unless you're debugging and you want to call them individually, which is um, completely um, an option. And then there's three different plotting options. So there's CBL, which stands for Central Blocking Latitude, um, IBL, which is Instantaneous Blocking lat Latitude, and then, um, and then uh, Blocks. Um, so here's the description of CBL. I'm, I'm just going to let you refer back to it um, because we still have a lot to get through. Um, and then IBL, this Instantaneous Blocking Latitudes using the, the Pelle Huskins method. Um, uh, same thing, a, a little bit of description of, of what that um, entails. 
and here's um, you know some some uh, of the plots that come from MetPlus. And then there's the group instantaneously black latitudes GIBLs, um, and um, you know once again description of that. Um, here's uh, not only IBLs and, and the group instantaneous black um, uh, latitudes, but also the number of events that were considered to be blocked. Um, so the the um, the package also as uh, computes those those um, number of events that have been blocked. And then um, what uh, what the um, package then does is it writes out a, a met matched pair record. That's what MPR stands for. Um, uh, in order to be able to compute additional skill scores. And we, we're still working on developing um, examples of, of how to, to you know, um, compute those additional skill scores. Um, but the capability is there. There's also um, weather regime um, analysis, um, also in the 4.0.0 um, the uh, release, so it's in the main branch. Um, you know, uh, once again, there's, uh, you know, you can either run it on model, observation, or both. There's the pre-processing um, steps, um, optional pre-processing steps. Then there's the um, the, the calculation of, um, of, of um, what you need for weather regime, and you can run run it in any of these different ways using elbow EOFs and k-means. Um, and then um, you know depending on what you're uh, how you're calculating it, then um, your plotting options are elbow EOFs and k-means. Um, and then here's a description of what elbow means. And here's a, a plot um, uh, from the, the elbow method. Um, and then uh, if you're using EOFs, um, once again, here's a, a um, description of what, what that, um, that particular methodology um, will look like. And then if you're using k-means, um, what that methodology uses for computation. Um, and once again, here's an example of, of um, what is plotted um, using MetPlus. So you can kind of look at um, the blocking um, uh, decomposed by weather regimes, um, or excuse me, the, the weather regimes, um, the decomposition of the weather regimes. Sorry about that. Got a little confused in my description there. Um, and there's up to six of them. And then once again, um, the, the, um, the tool writes out the um, Met match pair record. Um, so that additional um, skill scores can be um, developed or it can be computed. And um, once again, we're still working on developing the, um, the use case to compute those skill scores, but the, the ability to write out the, the MET match pair, um, you know, is, is available. And then you can just run it through the MET stat analysis tool to compute um, a skill score. Uh, we also added in um, TC Genesis di diagnostics, um, once again in, in version 4.0.0, and, and so it's in the main 4.0 branch. Um, basically what this does is uh, it uses the TC Genesis tool that is in MET um, to identify TC Genesis, and the, the definition of Genesis is configurable, and um, at the moment I cannot remember off the top of my head exactly how Genesis is defined um, for these um, plots, but uh, we you know, we can you can look at the the um, the use case or the example to to see what configure app options um, were set for. Um, but here's just an example of um, this is for gen Genesis um, density function, and then this is looking at um, Genesis track density. So you've got your observed, um, what actually occurred, what was forecasted, and and then you can see the difference. Um, and that's uh, this is all plotted by by the tools. Um, same thing for just the tracks, observed, forecasted, and, and the difference. Um, and then uh, the, you can also look at um, some of the categorical, um, what goes into it, some of the categorical uh, statistics. So you can see observed, and then these are the forecasted hits over on the right-hand side. Um, and then right underneath that is the forecasted false alarms. And then um, it also uh, computes the forecasted hits and false alarms. So that's available for um, you know investigating uh, what's going on with both medium range weather and S2S as well. Here's an example of um, how to um, to actually get this particular plot, the suite of plots. Basically, um, how to run a, a MET plus use case. Um, you can see here that um, you need to um, you need to have um, Python with Cartify, Matplotlib, X-Ray, and Map and then um, have the MetPlotPy module or, you know, the location of MetPlotPy um, 
uh, uh, specified in your configuration file. You need to have MET um, 10.0 um, or older and MET plus 4.0 or older, or excuse me, newer um, uh, available. Um, you need to have GFDL Cyclone Tracker output um, and um, with the Cyclone Tracker being run in Genesis mode, that provides you with the forecast um, information. And then you need to have the, the um, uh, ATCF formatted PC best track data um, and that um, provides you with the observed events. Um, after that, um, there are a, a few things that you need to set up in, in your MET plus configuration file. You need to um, tell it when, when to begin um, uh, looking for data, um, where you will find the track um, input and, and um, or so the, the, um, the observed track um, information, the genesis information um, coming from the, the forecast, um, you know, where, um, you know, where you're, you're sitting on your system and then where you want uh, the, the output to be written out and where to find MET. So you do need to know a few things like where your data is and where you want to write it. Um, and you do need to know where MET is. Um, but beyond that, you, re you really should just be able to, you know, make a few changes and then, I'll, um, and then how you run it is run underscore MET plus dot pi. You give it a path to um, where this configuration file is. And then you give it a path to any other specific user um, system um, information you need to give it. Um, uh, it for example, once again, um, if there's uh, um, some embedded um, uh, um, uh, basically where where you uh, where you can where on your system it can find MET plus and and so forth. So it allows for some uh, for a lot of flexibility. Okay, if you need to get help, if you want to get up and and get going, there's user guide online. You can get um, get that here. Um, if you go to the MET plus user guide, not only does an overview and show you how to set everything up and and how to um, start learning how to configure. MET Plus, um, uh, but it also um, lists out all these use cases, which are examples. If you come to the section um, called Model Application, you'll come down, you can see Subseasonal to Seasonal. That will then bring you to um, a, kind of like a picture gallery that, that helps you decide um, which one you would like to, um, to uh, you know, work with. Um, and then you know, that, that points you to um, the name of the, the MET Plus configuration file that you need to start working with. As you're getting started, and if you have questions, um, we now our help desk has moved over to a uh, forum. So it's in um, GitHub. So you have to have a GitHub account, um, DT Center Met Plus discussions, and then you, you post your questions up there. Um, here's a laundry list of additional capabilities that we're expecting to come in over the next two to three years for S2S. Um, based on uh, our collaborations with uh, not only Maria, but uh, the other organizations I've already talked about. And you'll notice um, we are also working to extend support um, to look at a fully coupled system. So for marine, cryosphere, land, surface, model, atmosphere, composition, space, weather, and hopefully hydro. Um, and then our stretch goal is also to make that connection with MDTF um, diagnostics so that um, you know, the people who are using MET Plus can um, leverage all the other um, diagnostics that are in there. Um, and with that, I will take a few questions. Thank you for your attention. And I just want to mention, um, we will be announcing probably in about October, um, the first annual MET Plus users workshop and tutorial. Um, and we're tar targeting the March to April timeframe. Uh, we're looking at either doing a hybrid approach or maybe just doing fully online. I don't, I don't know that we're going to just have it in person only. And if you want um, to sign up for more information, um, go, go ahead and, and go to um, MET Plus um, sign dash MET Plus um, dash updates. Thanks. Thank you, Tara. Um, I don't see any new questions right now. Let's give it a minute or two, though. Wow, I answered everything. That's awesome. <laughs> so
So um, uh, there's a question, is there registration yet for the Met Plus um, workshop? Uh, the answer is no. That's where the announcement's coming out probably in October. Um, we have just actually formed our, our organizing committee. Um, we met last Thursday for the first time. This is being funded under the UFS R2O um, year two um, uh, project. And so we had to wait until July for our, our um, funds to, you know, for that pro um, project to start. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm hoping by, you know, uh, September-ish timeframe, um, we will have uh, a better understanding of exactly what we're doing so that we can then get a, um, an announcement out late September into early October. No other questions? Well, then I guess I'll hand it back over to you, Karen. All right, great, thank you. And thank you everyone for attending today. And just so you know, our next um, webinar will be the second week of September because of Labor Day, so it'll be September 13th. So thank you everyone and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Tara and uh, Maria. Well, thank you for having us. It was a pleasure. Um, Tara, there's this ATU session on the S2S matrix. Um, we are looking to um, the presentations that use the MATPLUS tools. It will be useful to, to, to advertise these tools for broader communities. Uh, do, do you get my email about that uh, ATU session? I, I can forward to you.